After that short delay, it's my pleasure to introduce Phil Patrick, who will serve as our moderator for today's discussion. First, a big thank you to Phil for joining us. Phil is an entrepreneur and an adjunct professor in the MBA program at Rutgers Business School. He's the founder of two successful startups, Four Leaf Strategies, where he's the current CEO, and Pharmastrat, which he sold to Decision Resources Group in 2011. He's a four-time winner of the Inc. 5000 Fast Growth Award. Phil's corporate experience was in the pharmaceutical industry in progressively responsible positions. He entered pharma after earning his undergraduate degree from Rutgers College and his MBA from Columbia University. During his RU undergrad days, Phil served as president of the student body and was a member of the prestigious Cap and Skull Society. Rutgers Business School Executive Education has been lucky enough to have Phil teach in some of our custom programs. Phil, I'm going to hand things over to you to introduce John and to get the discussion rolling. Thank you. Sounds fantastic. Happy to be here uh, as a graduate of Rutgers. It's always a pleasure to be involved with Dean Lay's lifelong learning commitments here at Rutgers Business School and throughout the Rutgers University community. So I'm so happy to introduce uh, my colleague, my friend, and accomplished entrepreneur, John McGuire. Uh, John has, is uh, an expert at search engine optimization and currently is the founder and president and CEO of International Voyager, a company which operates um, multiple websites and domains, both domestically and internationally, for crews and other closely related travel throughout the world. So what we wanna focus on today is talk a little bit about some of the, it's a, as you can imagine, cruise industry is a little tough these days and certainly has its uh, you know, ups and downs and challenges. So uh, what we thought we'd put together is a nice little program with my good friend, John McGuire, talking a little bit honestly and hopefully sharing some thoughts about setbacks that we've both had and what are some of the techniques that we can uh, you know, use to overcome it and hang in, and hopefully all of you find value. So as Margaret said, we have time for Q&A, and I encourage you to submit those in the Q&A box, and I'll try to talk with John a little bit as we go. So John, great to have you here with the Scarlet Knights, and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about your entrepreneurial journey and your role at International Voyager? Well, sure, Phil. First of all, thanks for, um, thanks for inviting me to chat with you today, and uh, Greetings from Boulder, Colorado. I'm out here dropping my daughter off. I came out last night, so, uh, so I'm, I'm here in the mountains today. Um, so International Voyager started, boy, it was almost 20 years ago. Uh, I worked at an incubator called Idea Lab. Um, they're on the West Coast, and we had a New York office as well, too. And what we did was incubate and launch companies, um, some famous technology companies that are out there today. Um, and at one point, I wanted to, to launch my own company and decided that um, I wanted to do it outside the incubator because they would take over 50% equity stake in the, uh, the company if you launched it inside the incubator. And I decided to uh, pursue travel because travel was and still is one of the largest uh, uh, areas of e-commerce. It's information intensive. Um, you don't have to car carry a large inventory. Um, and I felt the, the spaces that were underserved were crews specifically. So, uh, so I launched International Voyager. That's uh, a, a brand that consumers wouldn't know us as. Um, it's our partners and, our, and uh, the IRS know us as International Voyager, but the brands that consumers know us as would be cruisedirect.com, cruisedirector.com, and vacationonline.com. Um, Cruise Direct is focused on uh, marketing and selling mainstream cruise, uh, cruise lines, whereas Cruise Director is focused on the luxury uh, expedition, um, ocean-going vessels, um, and uh, river cruising. So we have uh, sort of two brands serving two different markets um, there at uh, you know, Cruise Direct and CruiseDirector.com. All right, great. And yeah. is, that, uh, are you, uh, is that your house in the background, John? Or did no, you tell me? This, this is a, a, a suite that I'm actually not in right now, <laughs> but this, this, would be, this would be a, uh, you know, a suite on one of the larger ships. Uh, this is not your common suite. This is not what, you know, if you haven't been on a cruise ship, this, you know, this is, this is one of their higher end suites that you, uh, you could potentially say, and you can see a loft up there and you have these gorgeous views out, out the front and balconies and your own grand piano if you wanted to play. <laughs> oh, sweet. I don't think those are usually my typical cabins. That's awesome. <laughs> well, John, didn't you start your business on a hell of a day? 
if I remember I, correctly. I did. I started the company. I left in um I left the uh I left the incubator idea lab in 2000 uh 2001 and launched the company after I left the job and put a considerable investment into starting the company. We actually launched on September 10th of 2001. So uh you know it was it was uh quite a time to launch a travel company, but I I think because of that um, it gave us some some real advantages because we hadn't invested enormous amounts of money yet in marketing and in staff. We were just building the team up at that point. We had launched the product, but we hadn't uh, we hadn't put a lot out in terms of that. We did watch a lot of competitors quickly go out of business, and we and the suppliers themselves turned to us and really sort of threw money at us to get to get us up and running because they saw us as a, new, as a new player in the market that wasn't doing business the way all the traditional players were doing it, who were going out of business um, at the time. So they really gave us a lot of support and helped uh, ramp, you know, helped us ramp up very quickly. We sort of hockey sticked, I would say by 2002, uh, things started to come back um, pretty quickly. Um, and we had a lot of support from, from our suppliers to, uh, to, to really grow very quickly. Yeah. John, the threat there, obviously, the next day was the September 11th, you know, um, uh, yeah. terrorist bombings. So all Americans were concerned about security, whereas now they're concerned about a different fear, you know, and spreading virus. And what uh, similarities do you see and how does that affect your thinking? Sounds like it's helped you to think about it a little bit. It has. And I did think about it when I put the business plan together originally, I did, you know, you do put your threats together of what, you know, mm. what can potentially be disastrous and affect your business. And, and it's, you know, it's not funny, uh, but it, but it's, um, you know, I did put in uh, acts of terrorism um, because, you know, being on a ship or an airplane, I mean, they, they can be affected by that. I actually yeah, sure. financial crisis, which happened in 2008. And I put, um, uh, you know, shipboard viruses, uh, you know, I never expected anything. Nobody ever expected anything like this, uh, you know, global pandemic, but we did, I did put those into the plan um, and did put some, um, you know, some planning into what, what I would do in those cases. Um, mm -hmm. And it's how we, uh, you know, and there's a few others that I hope don't happen, a few other threats that I have in the plan as well too, that I don't mm -hmm. want to talk about, but, um, you know, but they were in there as well too. So um, with some alternative plans, what, what we would do during those kind of times. Well, and then previously, you know, you could use international travel, I would think, to diversify from domestic travel or Caribbean cruise, which is totally different than Mediterranean cruise. But this time, everything was a problem. Yeah. So the first time when, when the, uh, you know, so when 9-11 happened, like I said, we got a lot of support from suppliers to help build our business. And if we were just starting, so that helped us. 2008, uh, during the financial crisis, you know, travel was dramatically, everything was affected, right? Real estate, as we know, all across the board. The travel was dramatically affected here in the United States and, and uh, you know, and, and European countries. Um, and we were sort of, uh, we were sort of a deer in the headlights for probably for the first six months, like everybody else was. And then I, I realized that there were the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, uh, China, that, that, you know, that we're not going through what we are going through, that we're growing in leaps and bounds and that wanted to finally start traveling the world. So we basically turned our focus from domestic US at that point, it was probably about 70 to 80%. And we focused on those BRIC countries, including Australia. Um, and we shifted our business to about 70% overseas. Um, we, we moved some of our, our, our advisors, those are the people that answer the calls for the customers. Although most of our bookings, about 70 to 80% are done online without any help of an agent. Mm. But we moved those agents to, uh, we, we hired agents in those countries that spoke those languages um, so they could serve those guests in their own native languages. Um, so we were directing calls, we translated sites into those languages. Um, and that was the, sort of our next hockey stick. We realized, oh my God, the international market's very lucrative. We had almost no competition in those international markets. Yeah. Um, and we had some pricing advantages as well too. So that really helped us grow. And that's when we, I think when we got our first Inc. 5000, we, we got five Inc. 5000 fastest growing company awards over the years. And that was the first two were probably as a result of all of our international business that we we're getting at that point. Um, and then eventually we, you know, we shifted our call center uh, to the Philippines and we still do a lot of our development work overseas. Um, I remember that, John. Um, and can you share a little bit about right pre-pandemic, how International Voyager is set up? I know you have call centers, you know, you have the websites, but I know it 
and uh, I've, I didn't stay in that stateroom, but I've cruised through your company, um, but for the benefit of the people um, on the webinar. Yeah. What, what, so before, what were you looking at? We had a couple of things interesting going on. Right In 2019, our business had been just growing in leaps and bounds every year up through 2019. Um, we had a call center in the Philippines um, uh, near, near Manila um, at that point. And we had a center here in the United States too. Uh, you know, we are in Morristown headquarters plaza. Um, and part of it was this backup because we've had problems before, right? We've had, we've been through Sandy where offices, you know, yeah. power lost, offices were shut down and, you know, we couldn't serve customers at those times. Um, so part of the outside, outside of being able to find great people at a very low cost in the Philippines who really love serving guests, um, you know, which we always can't find here. Um, you know, we had a call center in Florida, which we couldn't find that kind of, uh, that kind of quality of people. Um, but part of it was to have, you know, redundancy, a backup system and, and um, um, you know, literally the other, you know, it's 12 hours time difference for us uh, on the right. other side of the world. Yeah. And at the, the time the pandemic started, I think it was on March 13th, our, our office and headquarters plaza was closing. Um, I think the whole building and complex was closing because of the, the pandemic. And I, I, you know, I, I thanked God that I uh, had a center in the Philippines that could um, that could pick up and, and take it from there because we were getting inundated with calls from tens of thousands of customers and guests who would either were on ships trying to get home or were about to leave in the next week and they wanted to know what the status was. Um, and driving home, I said, well, thank God we, we have this full center set up overseas. Um, and my manager from the, uh, from the center there called to say the president of the Philippines had um, had put a mandate in, in place to shut down all business and everybody also had to go home that night. So we had, you know, on, on the opposite ends of the world, you never, never expect that you'd be shutting both places down within hours of each other. So what happened next, John? I remember, everybody remembers the cruise ships that were stranded and all the people with April, May and June bookings, they must have, all, I feel like they must have all called your office to try they, to figure out what- At the same doing. time, because they, they couldn't even reach the suppliers to get help either because everybody was calling at that point. The suppliers are Norwegian and Royal and Royal. Yeah, Royal. we have about 20 different suppliers. Most of them are public companies that um, sure. that we work with, that we partner with. Um, and their, their calls were getting inundated. At the same time, you have a lot of your staff couldn't get into your office, couldn't get into offices anymore, or they're now becoming home-based. And nobody had, had anticipated this kind of, situation where all of your staff was going home. So you didn't have systems and internet and computers at, and people's right. homes to be able to support this. Um, yeah, so it was a bit of, it was a bit of a scramble and, um, you know, and, and I've never seen the call loads that we've had before and chats and emails coming in, uh, you know, and we, you know, we're committed to serving our guests under all conditions. Um, you know, we're, we're very efficient. We're, like I said, 70 to 80% of our bookings happen online. Um, you know, so we're super efficient, but we've never had, I guess, put a plan together to be able to support all of our guests simultaneously calling. <laughs> and we, you know, it was, uh, everybody was on, on the phone who could take calls. We relocated our, our staff here in New Jersey home, their home base. And it was pretty easy to get them up and running. It was less so in, um, the Philippines because our people were in what, what I call a vault, our office over there. We call it a vault. It's not like a vault, like a bank, but it's, it's a secure area where you have to use uh, biometrics to get in and um, you leave your bags outside because we handle credit card numbers. So there's PCI compliance rules when you're handling credit cards that you have to be very careful with. Um, and those people were using full-size computers. We never thought that we'd actually locate them from home. So we are scrambling to get them and their full-size computers home and internet connections are not the same in the Philippines and it could take weeks under normal conditions to, to get, a, to get a, a broadband connection to your house there. So you can imagine during a pandemic, it's call center hub of the world, everybody was going home, everybody needed those connections. So it took wow. weeks and weeks to get that. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, some businesses when mid-March hit, they just, they shut down, which is devastating, but literally no, the service dropped way off, right? If we think yeah. about a restaurant, nobody called the restaurant to ask them questions. They just stopped going and, you know, it goes to zero. How did you manage a situation where you still need high amounts of talent to answer the phone and handle all these res reservations, cancellations, reschedulings, rebookings, and now you have no revenue. 
Yeah, I mean, it was uh, really uh, for a while. It was trying to yeah, scrambling, really, um, yeah. trying to to get everybody on the phones to basically find out what those issues were from those guests, um, group them together, and have different specialists handling those different issues, because you couldn't electronically find this information because the suppliers themselves weren't able to get this stuff out themselves. So we'd have to get on the phone and be on with on hold for hours. So we'd have one person handling. 50 or 60 issues calling out to one supplier related to those issues, trying to get answers. And then everybody would either be on the phones back to those customers or, or an email back to them as well too. And look, I mean, worldwide, right? Ships were, there were ships that weren't even allowed to come into port. We had a, it was we had a customer. Crazy. Was, yeah, it was crazy. We, I remember the uh, probably, I think it was our last guest who was on a, an Italian ship that was in the uh, South Pacific. Uh, they were on a South Pacific cruise. Um, and when this, and this was, this was in late March, um, they didn't get off the ship until the end of April. The ship was in the South Pacific. They couldn't enter into, um, Australian waters. They can only replenish the ship. Uh, Australia wouldn't take them in, uh, India wouldn't take them in. So for a while, they're just sort of floating around in the Indian ocean. Nobody on board was affected and they were having a great time because they, you know, they were on this, this <laughs> week long cruise with entertainment and great food and everything else. I mean, but but nobody sort of knew where they were going to land. Uh, they landed, you know, sailing back to, uh, to Italy where they disembarked guests there. But it was a very confusing situation. Um, rules are still changing every single day. I was in the Virgin Islands last week. I, um, uh, uh, on the side, I, you know, I, I sail. So we were, we were sailing uh, in the Virgin Islands and down to St. Croix and back. But it, even while we were there, the U.S. Virgin Islands uh, put some rules in effect to require vaccines. Uh, before that, it was just a, a test to get onto the island. So it's, it's changing quickly. Um, you know, so I think we still have some, you know, some, some bumpy road ahead of us. Mm. Um, well, you know, how, what's, how are you handling this professionally? And, you know, the title of today is about resilience as you're today. And as you start to move forward, what are some of the things that you try to keep in mind, you know, um, to stay optimistic or to stay moving forward? Yeah. So we see, we are seeing a lot of demand. So we are seeing customers, you know, they they, they love cruising. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing experience and they're not going to stop. Um, a lot of them are booking out into 22 and 23. So we're, we're, we're selling into that period of time. The only issue with that is um, in our industry, you get paid when the person actually uses the trip, when they take the trip, when they consume the product. Um, you know, so we're waiting from a cash flow perspective, we're waiting for 22, 23 to get paid in a lot of cases. Um, so we're, we're incorporating some service charges in, into the booking process now. Um, you know, but it's good to know that our clients are, are you know, still really want to stay. They still really want to get out there. Um, and uh, as far as, uh, you know, otherwise from a cash flow perspective, our suppliers have still been very generous. Um, you know, it's, mm. it's um, you know, I give them I give them so much credit because, you know, they're they're pun intended, I guess, dead in the water right now. Uh, there's not many yeah. ships. Selling. They're just getting themselves out there and they're, they're sailing with just a, you know, 40% capacity. Um, they don't want to take it more than that. They don't want to crowd. Um, they're requiring vaccinations, but it will be, it'll be probably, we'll see maybe 50% of ships back by the fourth quarter. And then probably by the second, first or second quarter of next year, we'll see it back hundred percent, but they are, so it's, you know, they're, they are supporting us and having sort of their own PPP program. Um, How about that? But yeah, their own, um, their own, which you know, with very, very little paperwork, they were they're doing their own loans to to their important partners. So we were one of those important partners that you know have received funding from the cruise lines, like a zero percent interest, five year, you know, five year term. See, I didn't find that. I mean, uh, the, you're mostly uh, the featured speaker today, but in '08, I was leading a company servicing the large pharmaceutical companies. In financial crisis of 08, we were having a tough time. They were having a tough time. And instead of being more generous with their terms, they got a little tighter. So instead of paying the bills within 30 or 45 days, they started seeing it to 80 and 90 days, mm. which if you pay your bills slower, you don't need an MBA from Rutgers to know that in the short term, profit looks better if you take longer to pay your bills. Sure. And we squeezed on both less revenue and worse, slower payment, which was made it much harder to plan for. 
but it sounds like you you had a little more partnership with you know your um, partners. Yeah, which it was fortunate for us because you know we do our management team is here in the states, so our product manager for on the web you know on on web services our product management team was here, our marketing team was here. Sure. But our most of our staff is our advisors, our call center staff, and bookkeeping services. Um, they're all located overseas, so there was no PPP money for us because we don't carry that payroll. Wait, what? I didn't realize that. Yeah, so they're not going to support a company that's got their look. It's been it's been a it's been a key advantage of ours for years. Uh, the way we ran our business with our sort of our our thinking and, and, you know, our management team here and, and our, and again, like I said, it all started because we started serving guests in those countries and we needed advisors who could speak those languages. Of course. Um, why we started hiring there. And then we realized when we compared them against our Florida call center staff, the satisfaction rates were through the roof. The turnover rate was almost hundred percent in Florida. The turnover rate was almost non-existent for our international staff. And they really, they really love their job and they and they uh, they're very proud of that position. Whereas, you know, if you ask somebody here in the States, you know, I work in a call center, they don't always uh, feel the same way about it. So wow, I didn't really realize about the PPP. That's quite a difference. You know? Yeah, yeah, sure is. Because <laughs> uh, sorry, like, I don't mean to beat you up about you it. Know, but it's good... In restaurant businesses and all sorts of other businesses that are just, you know, just uh, uh you know, just uh, they're doing very well just through the PPP, you know. Right. Um, but well, any company yeah. that was outsourcing, which was the big management thing to do in 2017, 18, 19, yeah. 20, you know, my industry market research became, why are you hiring domestic people to do this when we yeah. can hire people in foreign countries, commonly India, um, who are very talented at a fraction of the price? But mm -hmm. boy, PPP really um, changes that. Yeah. And in our case, it wasn't really necessarily the cost in the beginning. Mm -hmm. It was the quality of people that we could get. Of course. And of course. the language skills that they had that really, of course, because we just couldn't get those language skills in, in the States. Wait. Oh, the foreign language skills. Okay. Right. Language gotcha. language skills. Right. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Um, I was thinking about some people who must be, who in a time of uncertainty put pressure on you. And how do you handle that? And you've got um, your teammates, your own employees. Hey, John, what are we going to do? When are the ships going to be back? You know, am I ever going to get a pay raise? Am I going to keep my job? So there's employees. And then there's also customers of your company that mm -hmm. asks all sorts of questions. And how do you, as the CEO, handle um, these uncertain um, situations? It's tough with 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 uh, staff first. Um, you know, we we made cuts. We were at forty five employees, and then we we cut down. I think now we're sitting probably around twelve. Um, I land up losing some of the key people I did not want to lose. So those people that were uh, e commerce experts, uh, my product management team. Um, you know, I land up losing these key people I've had with me. They're still working with me as you know on on the side but you know they knew that there's you know look e-commerce is exploding because of the pandemic it was it was growing anyhow before that so they knew they had they basically could could get jobs anywhere and two and two of my key people left um and then some of the uh service team bookkeeping teams we cut that back um scared the heck out of everyone else that was still there but i was um you know i've been very transparent with them, assuring them as well, too, that, look, you are the team that is going to be here when this thing restarts. And I need you every day to service those guests who are calling in, who have concerns. Um, so I think they feel now pretty safe in their job. But they're very anxious at the beginning when I was making those initial cuts um, that they may be part of it as well, too. Um, so but I am I am transparent. I do. I'm not you know, I'm not showing them the full p and And I, I think you had more of an open open book uh, management style. But with my um, uh, sort of uh, basic staff. I'm not necessarily disclosing that kind of information to him, but I am trying to be as transparent as possible, letting him know, look, we're, you know, we have funding that can support us through Q1 of next year at this level, um, you know, uh, but, you know, I, I expect that our, our business will, will start improving before then. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I uh, brought in everybody to the conference room and said, you know, at eight, at 9 a.m. and said, today we're making cuts. Yeah, it was brutal and had everybody come in every 15 minutes 
and I laid off 30% of the company. That's it. Like you're fired. Like I just, you're gone. We're not making it financial crisis of 2008. We are not making profit. It's either my personal money or your money. And I choose my money. It's brutal. It's not a publicly held company with vague concepts of profit. It's either, you know, me or you. So I get rid of 30% of the team, which was around 20 people, you know, a total at the time. And uh, everybody else that was left was real nervous and how to handle promising them I'm not going to make an, another cut ever wasn't realistic. You know, yeah. It's a tough situation. It I is. Think much... Yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, and I was saying, yeah, we're making, finally making a new management hire starting on Monday. So, you know, mm. so um you know and and also that's the other part of it too is it's finding people now who will come into our industry you know knowing that it's been you know that it's that it's that's that it's you know that it's did, currently it's damaged you know sure. so uh, it's a bit of a uh, bit of a struggle whereas before it's very easy i think to hire you know there's a lot of people that are looking for work um but i still think it's going to be a little challenging to get those e-commerce people that i that i know that's what's super interesting is for me i was hiring people who understood pharmaceuticals. Well, when Merck has a bad time, Bristol Myers has a good time. So generally these people are in the vertical, you know, they're committed to it. They don't leave to go and run, you know, work for Amazon, literally, Mm -hmm. they don't compete. Whereas you, it sounds like you had a different experience where people literally quit and go work for a major online you know, search engine optimization company or situation, they could work for Amazon. Yeah, they could. And um, yeah, I kept them on through all the years, but this was very difficult. As far as the client side, you were mentioning, Phil, um, yeah. we have a stellar reputation, you know, so during the course of our business, we've had, you know, 33 million people visit our websites, um, plan their vacations and, you know, probably about 600,000 um, customers um, on our websites who have, who have, you know, who are come back regularly to book their trips. Um, you know, we have a stellar reputation. Um, you know, if you look anywhere, search anywhere online for us, no matter where you go, BBB to power reviews, you're going to find that, you know, we have like a 4.8 rating overall out of five. So I think part, part of our issue was we wanted to make sure that we, we wanted to serve our guests. We wanted to make sure that we didn't damage our reputation during all this, which we didn't, thank God. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and I think because of that, customers can still sort of look at our site and say, okay, these are a legit company. They still will be around. We're not putting out messages that we're still around, <laughs> that we're still, right. we're sort of acting as business as usual. Um, and, uh, and I, I don't think we had to do too much reassurance of, of, uh, you know, with, with clients, um, a lot of it also too falls on the supplier side, the cruise lines, because pay, our payments get passed through to the suppliers to, uh, who transact them on their merchant accounts um, mm-hmm. to save, so we can save the two and a half percent on that. And um, you know, unfortunately, in some cases, refunds are coming back from the suppliers, and we still get calls to this day because the suppliers are still not that they're holding back. Uh, maybe they did in the first couple months, but it was really just a lack of staff and just confusion. Um, but I think they were pretty generous with guests as well too, giving them like one hundred twenty five percent credit on their next their next trip in the future. Uh, you know, if they if they didn't pull their deposit out and walk away so right. a lot of people kept their deposits there we uh we you and i talked a little bit i'd love to talk a little bit about things that you do as a person you know as a family man and as a as a ceo that help you to stay calm and help you stay focused during stressful times i know you're a sailor so that might be a good example yeah. and hiking in colorado uh for me i used to uh try to walk every day I'm not a long distance runner, but walking. And I'd grab a staff member and we'd do a walking meeting, but just sort of the oxygen out in West Central New Jersey um, would help me. It just would help me to be walking every day and uh, trying to eat right so I could control something on this planet. Um, What are some of the things that you've uh, been able to do or you try to do? I mean, my life before this was, uh, you know, I, I sailed on a hundred ships, traveled to 65 countries. Travel was what we did but yeah, as, a fa- uh, you know, as a family as well, too. Yeah. Um, so this was, you know, just personally, just a real punch in the gut, not being able to basically, we couldn't even leave our houses yeah. right for the first six months. 
Um, and I've also set up the business originally. So I always worked on the business, not in the business. But I found myself because I had to cut staff back and because of all the kind of exceptions that we we're having to the way we normally do business that I was deeply involved in the business. And I would say for months, I sat in that chair in my office with four screens. Uh, I've seen your office with all the screens. Yeah. That would and, stress um, me out. It's oh, very stressful. For, for months, I just couldn't sort of get myself out of that seat. Yeah. Um, you know, dealing with one emergency, an urgent issue after another, uh, you mm -hmm. know, and then I finally, like you're saying, we, you know, set up a, a regular habit of, of, you know, taking the kids out and walking the dog. I live in uh, Chester and 90 acres, a beautiful place nearby and also Hacko Barney. So, so hiking became a really important part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Um, exercise, cooking together for the first time, because we had this, you know, really busy family situation with three kids that's and, that's play. Right. and um, you know, everybody had sports after school, no one was around. And then all of a sudden we became like this sort of gourmet family where we were all, you know, picking out meals and, and all getting together in the kitchen and turning on, you know, Alexa and cooking away together. And I think that was some of the, uh, you know, probably the nicest experience that we had. That's there. nice. I got the Hello Fresh going too. We did you know, some of that too a couple of days a week. To this day, yeah. we still do that, and I think it's just a you know it's just a great way to go. Yeah, I think those are really specific tips. Yeah, um, uh, John, I'm looking for. I'd love for me and for the audience sort of keys to success uh, beyond this setback related to COVID. Um, winning the Inc. 5000 award is a big deal, and to win it more than once is a very big deal. And I mean, you've won it five times. What are some of the keys for the success and growth um, that you've had when times are normal? What do you? What are some experiences you could share? Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I, I guess looking at partners, um, looking at our suppliers. Um, you know, it was always really important to develop a really strong, tight relationship with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because they would. We'd, it would give us access to sometimes to inventory or to marketing dollars that you normally wouldn't get. So I think I spent a lot of time flying down to Miami. That's where most of them are based to really develop very strong relationships with our, our suppliers. That was always really important. Um, it was always really important for us to, uh, you know, to also make sure that we had a stellar reputation that we were providing, um, you know, just outstanding support service to, to our guests. And we would do that really by you know if a customer comes and engages us in live chat we're we're in the process they could give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and if it gives a thumbs down it would alert one of our supervisors who could then jump in the conversation and correct things on the fly which is really oh. helpful um when they called us we were you know when they when they have a call with us when they get off a survey would be sent to them as well when they booked with us on site survey would be popped and we're looking at these constantly all week long, making sure that we're providing the best support possible. And if a customer, one thing that we do a lot of is we're constantly improving, you know, and, I, and we've talked about this, you know, a thousand times about Kaizen, continuous improvement. We would constantly look at customer feedback and make changes to features, constantly evolving the site, which I know very few of our competitors, even the big ones like Expedia, don't really do. Um, so we're constantly trying to improve the product. Um, even down to the, uh, you know, our advisors in the field. I mean, we use, uh, you know, we, we use tools to survey them every single week on how their job was going. What did they think? What improvements could we make? What did they think of their manager? Um, and those were sort of rolling up to, to senior management and to myself. So I could see, I was very transparent every week and they were anonymous surveys. So yeah, you, you use that software tool, right? That um, pops up on your screen. I do. I use uh, we use Office Vibe, um, and it also gives you, uh, you know, gives you an, a really nice sentiment analysis of what of of and and you know so so our our frontline staff is being you know they're they're being rated and reviewed by our customers, and then we as managers are being rated and reviewed by our front by our frontline staff who's using tools to do that as well too, and we make you know we make changes and corrections along the way. Um, I probably always overspent on technology for the site, and we've always always overspent on technology for our for our staff as well too. So we give them systems that I'd be con that I'd consider to be sort of the Mercedes of systems to help make their life easier. A lot of our competitors don't do that, um, but the more that I can automate menial tasks for them, um, the better their life is going to be. The more time that they can spend on the call with the customer or on the chat with the customer, helping 
guide them through to find the best trip possible rather than having them fill out forms and you know filling out spreadsheets and going back to that kind of stuff so you know so if i can automate it that's really important um offshoring happened because like i mentioned we needed the offshore languages um and i just found to us um that was that was a, pr a pretty important thing as well too just because those people really truly uh, love their jobs and love what they do. And I, we just had a problem finding that same kind of thing when we were in Florida. With I think it's super interesting, John. I think offshoring has gotten associated with cost reduction. Yeah. But really what you're talking about is quality improvement. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and flexibility too, again, serve, to serve guests outside the United States as well too. Right. Yeah, um, yeah that's, um, that's great. That's, yeah. that's so I'd say, so I'd say, uh, you know, um, you know, improving the product, continuously improving the product, um, always having an ear, you know, to, to your customers and to your staff, make sure that you're doing everything you can do to continue to improve it within reason on costs, you know, of course. Um, but there's a lot of technology these days that are very reasonably priced, um, you know, that, that do you find uh, these reviews, um, are we talking mostly about Google reviews? Or are they uh, really who, everything? I mean, right where now, do people review your delivery? So these days they review everywhere, right? If you're not a okay. company, they're going to review you on, uh, um, you know, I'm trying to think of some of the big ones out there, you know, the big review sites, uh, how are they slipping my mind right now? But there's, there's a bunch of review sites you can go out to do. There's the BBBs or, you know, which are the sure. ones, right? There are our own reviews that we do in the booking process. So we're looking at all of that. Um, and there's do people- you get, Do you think Google buyers are looking at it too? You think- Oh, customers? absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, when you buy something too, how, how important is- And we also review, customers review the product after they've taken it. So when they re arrive home, they get a welcome home email where they can review the, the food, the entertainment, the ports that they went to. Um, they can also upload pictures. And it's funny, a lot of them do upload pictures of themselves with like the waiter on board the ship or the entertainer. Um, you know, and that's yeah. helpful, helpful content when like somebody like you, Phil, is you're looking yeah. at it, trying to decide between of one course. And, the other. and you can now read about people that are like you and what their experience yeah. is like. So that's important. And I just see reviews across the board. I just think it's, look, they can be twisted. Sometimes they can be, you know, not 100% out honest or accurate in some cases some companies do that like you hear about amazon mm -hmm. sellers that do that from time to time get away with it but um i just think they're just just it's just one of the advantages of the internet to have that kind of feedback it's a super advantage it's so interesting if you think i do mostly strategy consulting projects for drug companies right so i do this work and it's for j and j or novartis and let's say it goes well now i'm pitching at bristol myers squibb or you know GlaxoSmithKline. i'm saying hey the work will be good. Clients love me. They say, well, what work have you done? I say, I can't reveal that. <laughs> well, who have you worked with? I can't reveal that. That's confidential. So lawyers, accountants, strategy consultants tend to be more where you, don't, you can't see the reviews, but then in an industry like yours, it's a thousand times more important you're, you're constantly graded. We are. And it, look, we're monitoring social media. If somebody gives us a wow. bad rating, we're, we're reaching out to them saying, what did we do wrong and how can we fix that? And sometimes they'll, they'll, they'll change their rating, you know, they'll, they'll, you know, because it was some sort of, they were having a bad day. We might've made a mistake or in a lot of cases, it's our supplier that made the mistake. So we don't necessarily have control over the situation, but we can be an advocate for them to make sure that we fix it. Sure, that seems difficult, John. How do you handle that when uh, somebody buys a cruise through a company? Could be Norwegian, Royal, Viking, any of these, right? And they, for some reason, something goes poorly. And are they blaming you? They'll blame, they'll blame us. They'll blame the uh, suppliers. <laughs> um, you know, what we can do is make sure we get, reach out to them, be an advocate for them, help try to resolve the situation. It doesn't always get resolved because in some cases, the customer could be wrong. In some cases, the, the, the supplier itself has a policy that they're not willing to bend on. Um, we have, though, in those cases, gone to the supplier and made them write a letter for us saying, this is not the responsibility of, of International Voyager and Cruise Direct. This was our policy, solely our policy. And they're wow. doing, they, they did everything they could to, you know, to, to be an advocate for you. But we want to let you know the buck stops with us, the cruise line. And it's yeah. you know, and we're not going to, you know, we're not going to bend. So sure. that, that sometimes wins the customer where they know that at least that we worked hard for them. I case. can see that being difficult. Yeah. Say, Margaret, I know you're listening in for Team Rutgers. If people wanted to ask questions, we could easily work that in. 
Great. Well, yeah. while our audience is working on their own questions, I have uh, <laughs> a number of you, them for I told you. I told you John's the man. Yeah. <laughs> so, John, um, we talked just before we were going live earlier about the idea that, um, you know, you both have been in um, roles where the business had to be resilient. Would you talk a little bit about the resiliency of your customers in this case? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm surprised that so we've had a lot of customers who who have booked five or six times since this pandemic started, meaning that they've booked, and as soon as like three months out, sailings are available to book again. They're booking into those, um, and then that gets canceled because you know because the CDC still kept you know ships shut down, and then they rebook again for three months out. So, um, you know they. I, look, they're just, they, they love the experience. They love sailing and, and nothing will change that. Um, so I, I was surprised at how resilient were, they were. In some ways, I wanted them to slow down a bit because every time they were booking and rebooking with us, our, our call center is, you know, overwhelmed, you know, like rescheduling that, that sailing for them. And in some cases, we knew that, you know, the CDC was not going to, you know, they were not necessarily going to reopen things again. And, and the cruise lines were, wanting to at least show that that inventory was bookable from a public company perspective. They didn't want to say we're going to be shut down for the next year and a half. So they're like, yeah, three months from now, we'll be reopened again. You know, so uh, that would keep their stocks propped up a bit. So, yeah, they were, they were aspirational. Um, I think all of us were. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So a great question, very interesting question uh, came in and um I'm going to let you take this one down because it is about the cruise industry. But sure. if uh, cruise lines are hit with a crisis that limits uh, the ability to travel the seas, are they able to pivot and implement a contingency plan that provides cruise, ser cruise services, but while on uh, while docked, so that the customers could enjoy all the um, experiences but stay in one place? Great idea. Um, great question. Um, so the cruise lines are based in the United States and they're public companies, Royal Caribbean, Carnival Cruise Line. Um, their ships are foreign flagged, meaning that they're flagged in Bahamas or Bermuda or Monrovia or wherever it happens to be. Um, those ships can't, can't do business in U.S. waters, believe it or not. So they can't open the casinos or open their shops until they get out into international waters. Um, so there's really not much they can do with the dock. I think they do have permits to uh, special permits to serve alcohol and food when they're, you know, when you're getting on board and you haven't left yet. But uh, as far as uh, casinos, which is a big money maker for them, and uh, you know, and, and shops, all the duty free shops that are available on ships, they can't they can't um, they can't open those until they get out to sea. But great idea. There's some other laws too that are in their effect that don't allow them to to sail between US ports. They have to sail to a foreign port before they can get a US port. So unfortunately they can't even cruise the coast from US city to US city uh, taking business. Oh, interesting. There's a whole um, you yeah. know, set, of, set of rules that we as the uh, consumers have, have no idea. <laughs> John, I went on a cruise uh, through the Baltic Sea. I think you may remember that one. Uh, I yeah. thought it would be a good idea to cruise to Russia and Estonia and, you know. That's one of my favorite. Yeah. Yeah, it was, it was really good, but we had choppy weather in the Baltic Sea and they skipped the port. You know, there's, they get on the loudspeaker. That's it. We're not stopping at this port. We're going to the next one. There's no talk about a refund or anything like that. It seems like an unusual industry where we all just sort of agree that the captain will do his or her best. But there's, it's, it's a, it's a, the itinerary is not exactly set in stone. Does that, how does that make it hard to sell and represent and work with? I would say 99% of the time you are going to sail to the ports that, that you've been promised. Oh, okay. um, very, very rare that, that, they, that they'll miss a port. It usually happens in a place that you don't have a dock that you can dock the ship to. So you're maybe you're anchoring um, in a bay and you're taking, what small, you're taking the tenders to shore, which can be a little bit dangerous. The, the captain's priority is always the safety of the guests. Uh, so if he feels like anybody getting off the ship in rough waters trying to get to a port is going to be a problem. He's not gonna. He's not gonna um, make that make that call. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm trying to think. In some cases, they, if it's a really important port, I know from time to time they've given onboard credits. 
or open the bars, um, you know, for, for not calling on a certain protocol. Some people, you know, but it doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Um, ships are amazing how they can, uh, you know, like if, if a hurricane's coming through, ships still sail during hurricane season in the Caribbean um, because they're fast ships now and they can see these storms coming along and, you know, far out. Um, so if they're supposed to sail to the Eastern Caribbean, it looks like a tropical storm or hurricane is over there and it's going to affect the islands, though they can, they can go to the West. It is in their ticket conditions. Um, customers, if they want to, could cancel and get a, get a refund or a future cruise credit for doing so. Yeah. Cool. It, but definitely it can get, it can upset people. You know, there was, there was a case, it was, it was a, it was a, a large uh, incentive group. It was a large non-incentive group. It was a large business group of lawyers on, I think that oh, went the same sailing in the Baltics and it might've been the same port you're talking about because yes. it's a challenging port to get into and yeah. the captain wouldn't go. And the lawyers uh, mutinied and threatened a class action lawsuit, and, they, and the captain threatened to take the you know the lead lawyer and lock him in his cabin if he created <laughs> any more trouble on the ship. You know, um, you know the safety, the safety of the passengers are important, right? It's like a pilot in a plane, right? Yeah, yeah that is that is, that, you, that is a good example. Yeah. Well, duct tape, but also well, duct tape like, you to your chair now if you're drinking too much and you're creating a right. problem. And a plane can land in a different city due to safety and you don't get a refund they yeah. they you know margaret i'm sorry go ahead john and i no can. no that's okay i'm uh, just yeah. not you know nodding in um in agreement um but i did i did have some other questions in our yeah. audience um you can mm -hmm. continue to populate the um the q a box i don't have to dominate um with my own questions but um john you mentioned um, a business principle uh, you know kaizen um, but I was listening to you and what I kept thinking about was um, agile methodology that you have to be using that because every plan you have, the circumstances change and you have to continually be, you know, kind of uh, ready for something new and you can't take your plan that you started with when the circumstances change. So uh, was I, was I reading that accurately? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, look, when I, you know, I did, like I said, had some threats when I, create the business plan years ago, but I thought this was going to be, I've been in some pretty wild and woolly businesses before this. And I just thought, you know what, this is going to be a cakewalk. Uh, you know, we're, we're at o OTA, an online travel agency specializing in crews like hotels.com. And I figured how easy, right? How, you know, this will be, this will be an easy business. And then 9-11 and then the financial crisis and then this, you know, but every business has, you know, has, has been impacted, right? So certainly, certainly uh, just uh, had to shout out for the business skills that are, you know, that are needed and, and in use for sure. Um, one other question that I had for you was um, you talked a bit about um, relying on um, international hires for things like language skills, but I would guess that there is also um, uh, culture, you know, local culture, um, that was probably a valuable part of that as well. Um, uh, Absolutely. Is that accurate? Yeah, it is. And we have people, we have some people in Europe because uh, Spanish speakers in Spain and, and German speakers in Germany um, and our Spanish speak, yeah, and also some Russian as well too. But primarily our group is in Central America and in the Philippines. And I spent a few weeks in the Philippines um, with a guide learning their culture, going as far as uh, visiting uh, visiting call center workers in their home. They're very generous and, and 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 really proud to show you like where they live and what their homes are like. And it really gives you a great um, understanding of uh, of sort of what makes them tick, what's important, and and you learn things that um, you know things that you would never do here um, over there. It's expected. Uh, you know, you'll ask them. They expect you to ask them. Are you married? Do you have a boyfriend? Do you, you know, do you live with your family? Are you the <laughs> oldest child in your family? Because if it's the oldest child in the family, they have to be the breadwinner for everyone else. Um, you know, there could be a, and it's it's not because they don't have the money. It's because they um, are so close to one another that they tend to live together in small housing, but they'll continue to stay there. Like you'll find, you know, sixteen people in a in a house that's you know probably the quarter size of a of a U.S. home. Everybody is college educated because of the U.S. education. You know, we had we gave them. The U.S. did give them a gift of uh, of uh, the U.S. educational system over there, so they all go through high school, and almost all of them uh, go to college and graduate from college, and they're very proud of that. Um, so yeah, so there's some some really big cultural differences that you have to be really sensitive to 
Um, you know, so if you, you know, I found I had somebody coaching me on the interviewing process and said, if you don't ask, I said, I'm very uncomfortable asking these questions because um, we'll never ask these questions in the States. And they said, if you don't ask them these questions, um, they, they will look like you've insulted them and you're not interested in them and they, they won't accept the job. They won't, they won't consider you like caring. So. Wow. Wow. You know, wow. I know that is, that was a way more than I expected when I asked that, that question, yeah. I was thinking just some local custom kind of thing, but wow, yeah, yeah. very, very it's amazing, interesting. Like in country, how, how different they can be. And if you, if you work along their cultures and adapt to it, um, I think you can run a better business in the country. John, how does that affect your customers? I mean, you have buyers of cruises from all different countries around the world. They probably want a, a different experience. You know, they might ask different different service levels they're looking for. I mean, if I buy a cruise, I'm really not looking to have an ongoing dialogue. I don't need you to arrange my meals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, how has that, how does that affect your business? Um, thinking about global buyers and customers. Global buyers for the people that we're servicing. Customers, the actual people on the cruise. Sure. Yeah. Like, do uh, they interact differently as well as foreign language? Um, they do. I mean, there, there's, there's differences out, out absolutely between them. Um, but yeah. I think most people, most people do want, you know, a caring, uh, advisor to help them through the process that, yeah. you know, I mean, a lot of those skills are the same, right? Um, That's good. listening carefully to, to, to the customer, you know, spending 80% of your time listening instead of talking, I think is sort of a global, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of a, you know, it's, it's, mm people around the world, you know, want to be, want to be heard and, and want to be understood and then want you to, to offer them a solution. And I think that's pretty universal. And, um, and I, and I hate to say, but I think our, our teams in, um, you know, especially in the Philippines, I think are just, um, you know, more, more empathetic, more, you know, more willing to listen and, and, you know, and, and, you know, and, and you know, and then when I had, um, our Florida uh, team, who was very abrupt and just, I want to close the sale and I want to move on, you know, and they really didn't want to, you know, there was, there was cases where we had somebody that would close the sale and the customer would call back to, to speak to that advisor. And the advisor was like, no, I just closed <laughs> it. Talk to service. They'll, they'll fix your problem. Like, but you, you made the problem. <laughs> you know? So you never find that, um, you know, in the other places that we do business. So people vary in terms of the partnership they look for. For example, sometimes, I want to book a cruise in February anywhere where it's warm. But then other times I want seven nights, including Montego Bay in March, early March. So the way I engage with the website, the way I engage with your team does differ a little bit. You know, it, it how, does how do you handle that? I don't mean to be, um, you know, like we that we turn customers away, but what we really do is, uh, you know, we have, Everybody that comes to us is going to come to us through our website. Um, we're not advertising sure. our phone number or our chat service sure. or email anywhere else in the world. So we send them to our site and every single page has live chat and customers and our advisors can guide you through the process. Um, but we really want customers to spend a great deal of time there. And, and you know, we have so much content that they can yes. learn and decide where they want to go. And people these days, that's what they do, that they, they yeah. really want to do their own research online. There are a few that, that don't, but they typically will go to some high-end, uh, you know, travel agent who's going to charge a five or $600 fee on top of the cruise that they're booking. Um, so we don't find many people who come to us and say, I don't know where I want to go and what I want to do. They typically will spend, you know, uh, an hour or two wandering around and start dreaming and looking at dates and destinations and departure ports and watching videos and see what the weather's like there, and look at the maps. And then by the time they, they reach out to us, they're like, hey, what's the difference between this and that? Or I'm looking oh, for this, good. but I want, I want, you know, I'm going up the inside passage of Alaska and I want to be on the port side overlooking the glacier, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so people are pretty, and we like that too. Um, you know, so we're not on the phone with somebody for an hour and a half. And each time we're on the phone with somebody for an hour and a half, it can be a bit of an, an experience, uh, uh, a, uh, um, inconsistent experience, you know, cause you have people that, you know, advisors that are all well-trained and certified in all their products, but they all have different perspectives on things and can give sort of different stories to people. Whereas online, we've created an experience that 
is universal. And then come on over to us, pick up the phone, call us, live chat with us, text us if you want to, you know, sure. then we, and we can carry you through the process. And then we watch, you know, when they do finally engage us, you know, we can, and we're not doing this in a creepy way where we know, know their name and what they do. We just, we can see their, their patterns on our site. We can see that they came in and they went to the honeymoon section of the site. And now they're looking at Hawaii cruises. Um, so when our, when our advisor finally starts chatting with them, they know, they sort of have a bit of a background on the customer. The customer, you have to explain to them, I'm a honeymooner looking for a Hawaii vacation in March. Our guy will already have some understanding of that and can start and jump right into the process with them. That's great. Yeah. Uh, we had a, a question come in um, about what changes might you make um, to the cruise industry? What changes might happen in the cruise industry or would we yeah, make? Or I think this person was giving you all the power. What, if anything, would you change about the cruise line industry? What would I change with the cruise line industry? <laughs> they, they do a lot of, I mean, they, they do, they're very innovative um, and they're still building tons of ships right now all over the world, mostly in Europe. Um, you know, they're very easy to work with. Um, I think they're doing the right things now. I, and I know, I know it's political and people have different feelings about vaccinations, but I think requiring vaccinations on board um, because you can't even call on some countries if everybody's not vaccinated. Um, so I think that's, you know, I know it's, I know I'm going a little political on it, but I think it just keeps everyone safe and it keeps the countries they're visiting safe who don't have a lot of medical resources. They don't have ventilators in a lot of these countries. So I think that's, that's one thing for the short term. For the long term, um, that's a great question. I don't, um, I don't, I think they've been doing it right. I, I really yeah. could imagine. I mean, there, there's laws in, in effect that they could lobby to try to change, like the Jones Act that I was talking about that doesn't allow you to call on two U.S. ports in a row because I think there's, you know, I think that would be a great experience for Americans if that, that, that law could be overturned. Um, so you could actually, you know, mm. sail up the coast of, you know, of, of uh, you know, California and that kind of thing. Mm. But no, I think right now they're, they're, they're doing everything right. Um, yeah, I just, I don't, I don't think there's any more that they could do. They, That's they, great. These ships are getting better and better and better all yeah. the time. I mean, it's unbelievable. I think in the end, when this is all over too, that these ships will be a protective bubble, to be honest with you, because of the procedures and things that they've put in place now to, uh, to make sure that, you know, they'll, they'll be minimally affected by any kind of shipboard virus or, or, you know, this kind of stuff going forward. Because that was a problem in the past where you'd have, you know, somebody would pick up some sort of uh, norovirus on board an airplane and then, you know, on their vacation, head to the ship and then spread it around in the ship. Of course, it's never traced back to the plane because cruise lines have to report to the CDC every time somebody gets sick. Oh. Airlines don't have to do that. Hotels and resorts don't have to do that. Um, so that, that's why these would show up in the press and the news would jump all over it. But those, those viruses were not starting on the ship. They were being brought from somewhere else. So I think uh, maybe even, um, you know, uh, uh, even tight, tighter, you know, tighter. I think these, the processes are putting in place now will eliminate or at least, you know, almost eliminate a lot of those kind of things that we used to have in the winter. Yeah. That's great. That, that's an interesting way of looking at it. That's great. Yeah. Well, John, I'm one of the representatives for Rutgers University and uh, I appreciate it. Margaret, you want to bring us home for now? But uh, I thank, do. Thanks yes. Thank you both so much. I learned a lot from both of you, and I know, I know our audience was taking it in as well. Um, yes, love the team spirit. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, really, really interesting, um, and makes me definitely want to to jump on a cruise as soon as I have an opportunity. Um, but uh, as we close, I just want to remind our audience that the RBS Virtual Lunch and Learn series does take place on Wednesdays at noon Eastern, specifically third Wednesdays of each month. And we hope that's nice and easy for you to remember by being in the middle of the week and the middle of the day. For more information, you can always visit our webpage. I know this is long and anyone who has registered will receive this information via email, but it's business.rutgers.edu slash alumni slash lifelong dash learning. And we have an exciting schedule of topics and presenters lined up over the next several months, thanks to great suggestions from our audience. So we encourage you to keep sharing those great ideas. Um, we want the series to continue to meet your needs. So please stay online for just a moment longer as today's webinar ends. You'll immediately see a very brief three question survey about today's event. And one is a free form field that you can type in those topics or speakers. 
And finally, as I mentioned when our webinar began earlier, a link to the archived recording of this presentation will be shared via social media and emailed to you. It'll also be found on the Business Insights page of our website. So thank you, Phil. Thank you, John. Thank you, everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day and bye for now.